it can't answer that question, then this holy book's claim about God, your pitch, you pitch the whole book, it can't be true. Because it's not answering number six, the justice question, because justice would have to be the foundation of evidence of God. God has to be paid for sin. Period. Now, in practice, what that's going to mean is you're going to pitch out, pitch out, pitch out, pitch out. Because the only holy book I can find that answers how God gets paid for sin, not how man is affected by sin, but how God gets paid for sin. That's not the same question as man being punished for sin or man suffering some kind of reprimand or any other kind of discipline to man. Okay? Because you're talking God's level. The payment at God's level has to be God quality. Got that? Otherwise an injustice is occurring. So number six is evidenced by number eight, the holy book. Because number seven, breaking communication is evidence of absence okay but if you got a book then you don't have a break in communication unless you won't read the book in which case that's not evidence of the absence of God that's the evidence of the absence of your common sense because if there's an absolute God he had to figure out some way of communicating to you in a manner that wouldn't make you freak out okay so here you got a holy book you read the holy book it depicts a certain character of someone called God does it make sense? Does it pass the smell test of God getting justice? And they don't. The holy books don't. Because they sidestep the question of God getting paid for sin. The Quran sidesteps it. The Jews sidestep it. The Old Testament answers it. But the Jews sidestep it in their formulation of God. The whole Zoroastrian thing sidesteps it. The Baha'i sidestep it. All of your monotheistic Okay, they sidestep it. The Old Testament answers it, the New Testament answers it. But, there are a lot of Bible books, wannabe Bible books, books that claim they're part of the Bible. Okay, do they pass the character test? Do they pass the justice test in number six? See how this ends up being a simple question of, okay, if I want to prove the existence of God, I start with the most implausible, which is the hardest to detect, which is absolute God. And then really all I need to do is just start reading the holy books. Because if they don't answer the question of how this God gets paid for sin, at God's own level, then there's no such thing as the kind of God they're talking about. Pitch, 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 and then when you, you end, you'll end up getting stuck with the Bible. But there are a lot of books that claim to be Bible that aren't, and you just have to read each one. Pitch, 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 and there are a whole bunch of them to pitch. I mean, the 66 books of the Bible that, you know, Protestants talk about, those, those pass the test. But I'm saying that. You have to prove that for yourself. Anyway, you see how cool this is? So we started with nine, which is pick the most, at, pick the most you know, implausible idea of God. That's absolute God. Then figure out what the characteristics of that God ought to be, which is number one, something you can know and recognize. And then after you've come up with those characteristics, now you're going to run it through the elimination test. Number two, when evidence pre is present that suggests a better explanation than the definition of God you have, then you have to go back to the drawing board and revise your explanation. Number three, smell test. Evidence of something else being present. In other words, something else that contradicts um, the formulation of God you have. Mutually exclusive or rarely found together. Like you, if, a, if it's a God of love, you're not going to find hate. You shouldn't find love and hate in the same place. Of course, you have to make sure you got the right definition of love and hate there. Okay, because love punishes too. You know, kids are punished by their parents. Okay, and the kids think their parents hate them, but it's not hate. Okay. Then you got number four, when the thing being sought for is found somewhere else and cannot be in two places at once. And that's where we introduce the idea, especially with absolute God, that you cannot have unpaid sin and just God in the same place. You can have a sequence where the sin is unpaid and then God does something to pay for it that really pays him. But if God's just one absolute, there's no way he can pay himself because he'd just be moving money from one pocket to the other. 
So that, that shows the two places at once. You can't have unrequited justice, total, you know, forever unrequited justice, and injustice exist in the same juridical place at one time. Okay, that led to number five, when evidence which is present is contrary, and of course the evidence that's contrary to, in this case, one absolute God, is that here we all are and we're small and sinners. Okay, so there is a justice question, which is number six, the necessary foundation for the evidence um, is absent. Okay, the necessary foundation of the evidence which must be present is what justice does God get? If God is not getting justice, then God is really not God. If God is not getting justice, he's not righteous because he's not able to ensure righteousness to himself. He's not just because he's not able to ensure justice to himself. He's not omnipotent because he can't do something. And certainly not love because love would not allow injustice to remain. It doesn't mean there's no hiatus of time between the event and the recompense. But love is not going to let it remain. So then that same God who can't be righteous, just, or love himself, and is obviously not omnipotent, isn't really God then. And of course, doesn't isn't able to be righteous, just, or love me, you, us, humans. See? See how cool this is? So kudos to... Um, symbolic and and to and to Veritas 48. Okay, you guys really made my day. Thanks. Sorry, I was so long-winded.